everyone, and welcome to episode 187 of the Medieval Podcast. I'm Danielle Sapolsky, also known as the 5-Minute Medievalist. Everyone knows that the vast majority of people in the Middle Ages were not lords and ladies. Many of them were unfree serfs. But what is a serf? What did they owe to their lords? And what led to the end of serfdom? Traditionally, historians have pointed to English serfdom as falling into decline at the end of the 14th century following the Peasants' Revolt. But do the manorial records actually support this theory? This week, I spoke with Dr. Mark Bailey about serfdom and its decline in medieval England. Mark is Managing Director of Duke's Education and a visiting professor of later medieval history at the University of East Anglia. He's the author of several books, including Medieval Suffolk, An Economic and Social History, 1200 to 1500, and, most recently, After the Black Death, Economy, Society, and the Law in 14th Century England. For this episode, I spoke with Mark about his book, The Decline of Serfdom in Late Medieval England, From Bondage to Freedom. Our conversation on serfs, their place in society, and the true catalyst for the decline and fall of serfdom in England is coming up right after this. Well, thank you, Mark, for joining me to talk about serfs. It is long overdue I'm talking about serfs, and I think you are just the right guy to talk to about this. So thanks for joining us. It's a pleasure to try and elucidate more on this important but dark subject. <laughs> when I emailed you, you said that you're always happy to talk about serfs, and it's great to have someone who's always happy to talk about serfs. You are the guy for this. So tell us, what is a serf? What is serfdom? Serfdom is is really a genus with very many species. So it's one of those terms that people use regularly, and there's a sort of broad assumption that people know what it means. But in reality, it covers a vast range of different relationships that existed right down to the 19th century in in some parts of Eastern Europe, but were commonplace across the whole of Europe, probably between the sort of 7th and the 17th centuries. And essentially, it describes a set of relationships between a person and a lord, but also the land that that person held and the lord that they held it from. So it describes a set of personal restrictions over the behavior and the, the ability to do things like marry without consent or to move away from the home without consent. And it also relates to a certain set of packages, a rent package attached to a land. So it might involve things like personal labor services in return for the land as opposed to paying cash rents as we would understand today. So that very generally that that's what it's about. But what it meant from one place to another is very varied. Yes. And so this is one of the reasons why serfdom is such a fraught term in our circles, right? Yes, but it's an important subject as, as well. And it's understandable that historians want to engage with it because it is potentially a highly demeaning, constraining and oppressive form of social relations. It creates an excluded class of people, of men and women, often comprising a sizable a minority or even a majority of the people in a given society. So looking back from the 21st century, we have a strong moral repugnance to it as a set of social relations. But another reason why it's of interest to historians, of course, is that the dissolution of serfdom, the removal of serfdom, is often regarded as an essential precondition to the growth of the markets, the growth of liberal modernity. Uh, and so our interest in it is, why does it disappear from some places earlier than others? Why does it have to be overthrown by revolution in Russia, say, or in, in certain parts of, of Eastern Europe, yet it dissolves in other parts of Europe at a much earlier date. And that's the fascination. Yes. Well, I think that there is some confusion among the general population today about the differences between serfdom and slavery. What is the difference between these two? Essentially, a slave has few rights and is almost an owned chattel 
of the person who owns the slave. Serfdom is still a highly constraining social condition, but a serf is not entirely without rights. And serf possesses more freedoms, perhaps more freedom to alienate the land that they hold or to alienate the goods that they hold. And there are fewer constraints upon their movement. They might even have rights within a broader legal system so that they might have some defensible legal rights that were not available to the slave. I think it's important to make that distinction because it can be confusing when you have a lord who has rights over a person. So let's talk about some of the restrictions that a serf might have on them. And just for everyone to know, your specialty is on England. So if it's easier to kind of work with just England, tell us what some of the restrictions were on people. Yeah, the main sort of restrictions associated with serfdom to varying degrees across Europe is restrictions on freedom of movement. So at the very least, the requirement to get your lord's permission to move away either temporarily or permanently. Another obvious characteristic of of serfdom is the requirement to perform labour services. Now, in feudal society, performing service for land, in return for land, is commonplace, but there are more honourable services and there are more dishonourable services. So, for instance, performing military service is an honourable service in return for land, But the least honourable form of service are labour services, agricultural work that a peasant, a serf, has to perform on the farm, often called a domain, but on the home farm of the Lord. So labour services, certainly, restrictions on movement, often a requirement to obtain the Lord's permission to marry. Marriage being, of course, a hugely important and very personal element in in any person's life, the notion that one has to obtain seniorial permission, perhaps even to pay a fine, or indeed to actually get permission to get married, is clearly a significant constraint and an element of, of subjugation. There may be some other restrictions as well on the surf, but I think those are the three most significant ones. So this brings me to the important question, because I think that there is still this myth going around that a Lord has absolute rights over people's bodies to the point that you have prima nocta, which we always see in Braveheart, right? So how much power does a Lord have over his serfs? Does he have the power to just sleep with whoever he wants? That Braveheart example sticks in everybody's mind, and yet there are no, as far as I'm aware, documented examples of Prima Nocta in Scotland or in England. It simply is one of those huge myths. It wasn't part and parcel of civility in, I think, most of Northwestern Europe, certainly in England. But it is enduring, and it sort of captures the invasiveness and the oppressiveness and the sort of patriarchal dominance of serfdom. Uh, The reality, certainly to talk about England, is, is very different. On the one hand, the serf is excluded from accessing the courts of common law, the king's court, which effectively removes from the serf a right of appeal. But in, interestingly, in theory, a serf can take legal action against other people, but not against his lord in the royal court. So there are one or two legal loopholes. And then in terms of the relationship between a serf and a lord, there is quite a difference between the theory of what is possible and the subjugation and the range of dues and permissions that the serf has to get and the reality. And to give you an example, in England, serfs are required to pay a merchant, which is is a payment in lieu of the Lord's permission to marry. So effectively, the Lord commutes his formal permission into a payment. Well, most of the studies that have been undertaken of communities when serfdom is supposed to be at its peak in England in about 1300 shows that less than half of the women who were liable to pay merchant actually did so. 
And so what we, we need to do is look under the surface of, of the theory and see what's happening on the ground. And this is one of the great complicating factors in trying to understand serfdom, because the, the theory is very clear. The reality is often very different and distinct. And it's clear that seniorial power does not enforce all of the elements of serfdom, and indeed sometimes is waiving many of the sort of seniorial rights or charging a nominal sum. A another good example is around 1300. There's no doubt that serfs are wandering away from the manor in England and travelling to try and get work in towns and so on and so forth. Lords don't know anything about it. You know, they, they probably only try to enforce some kind of licensing system or a prohibition on movement on a fraction of the serfs who are moving about. So it, it really is important to get one's hands dirty, deep into the sources on the ground to see how it is being implemented in practice, as opposed to the theory, the theory that they believed in the in the 13th century, and which some historians have tended to assume that the theory is the same as practice, and it's not. I think that is so important because I think it's something that is generally consistent when you see sources, especially in legal codes, that say the punishment for this is, you know, execution or something. And in the actual records, you see fines. You don't see executions that often. Like, this is something that happens quite a lot. When you get into the weeds, you see that there is a lot more leniency, a lot more human-to-human -human interaction, right? And I think that's particularly true of serfdom because it is to us such a morally repugnant set of social relations that if you see an example that, for instance, a lord has forced his serfs to walk around barefoot in the church, being occasionally whipped as penance on a Sunday because they have refused to do some servile exaction, which undoubtedly happened. If you see that example, we, we immediately think, well, this is a terrible way to behave and it must have been widespread. But actually, those types of events have been recorded because they were so exceptional and they were not the norm. Yes, that could happen under serfdom and that uncertainty about the ability of a lord to behave very badly and then what recourse does a serf have if that happens and the serf's position is without question vulnerable because of those power differentials within society and the and the strict legal theory but it's it's about the typicality you know how often did it happen and actually a serf's collaborating with their lords much of the time and actually getting on the surface and beyond our moral repugnance of this set of relationships to see what actually happened. Absolutely. So your work, at least the book that I've read that you've written, was on the decline of serfdom. And you looked at a range of manners to see if you could find something that was typical. So can you tell us where were the manners you looked at and about how many you looked at for the records that you used? Yeah, much of the work on serfdom has tended just to take anecdotal examples from local records and assume that they are probably typical of the way in which serfdom operated and was mediated between seigneurs and serfs. And so what I decided to do was just quantify every single example of a marriage fine, of a license to leave the manor, of charging for mill suit, of tallage, how many labour services, how often the peasants resisted labour services, every single mention of this over basically a 150-year period or 38 manors for which there was a decent documentary record to sustain that type of research, which captured a range of different types of manners because Monastic landlords were often the most bureaucratic. They were the most likely to enforce serfdom more strictly, and they have attracted most attention in the historical literature because most of their archives have survived, so they're easily accessible. But the majority of landlords in medieval England were low-status gentry lords with much less 
power and clout and therefore less likely to enforce serfdom. So I made sure that my 38 mana sample had a number of lesser lay landlords as well as monastic landlords in there and was spread across the country from the freer areas in the east to the more manorialized and heavily feudalized in the central counties of England in order to get a representative sample, but also to try and quantify, not rely on anecdotal evidence. I wanted to count and count and count again. It, it took me eight years. It was dull as ditch water. <laughs> I didn't want to look at another surf for another three years. Okay, I've, I've got over it. I'm looking at surfs. I'm <laughs> counting surfs again. I now know why people tend to be anecdotal in their examples when trying to describe surfdom. Because counting everything for something like, I think, well, over a 150-year period, I think I looked at about 4,000 court rolls, which is probably something like 150,000 separate entries and it was a it was a monumental piece of work and it just proves how dull I could be for <laughs> eight years I think you're right this is why people haven't done it <laughs> <laughs> but it was worth it because you made some really important discoveries so I think that the the general narrative and this is something that you mentioned in the book is that things got unsettled after the Black Death, but it wasn't until the Peasants' Revolt, when people got really upset about being serfs, that things started to change and that that started to decline. But this is not what you found in the records. Tell us what you found. One of the great assumptions about serfdom is how do you determine why it disappears in Western Europe in the later Middle Ages, and yet it has to be removed by decree from Russia in the 19th century. Why is it preserved in one area and why is it, does it disappear in another? And the general, it's a very, very crude generalization, but, but the main narrative was that it, the decline of serfdom is a function of the degree of resistance amongst the peasantry to the impositions of serfdom. And that you, you essentially get the growth of class consciousness in the later 14th century in parts of Northwest Europe, and you get mass movements of peasants that result ultimately in seigneurial power waning and bargaining away serfdom in the face of concerted resistance and growth of class consciousness. And there's no doubt that resistance and human agency is an important part of why serfdom disappears in some places and not others. But it, it, it was a theory. And historians, I felt, had tended to just pin little anecdotal examples that fitted that chronology and theory. So what I wanted to do is, okay, have a look at all of the key elements of serfdom, merch it, death duties, heriots, license to move away from the manor, tallage, labour services. Okay, when did they disappear? You, you can't theorise about the reasons for something disappearing without actually carefully and reliably establishing the chronology in the first place. And I, I didn't actually go into the research intending to find something that went against the standard narrative. I was expecting to prove it with perhaps one or two changes. And what I discovered is that the tenurial elements of serfdom and many of the personal elements of serfdom were being bargained away in England almost as soon as the Black Death had hit. So we're talking the 1350s and the 1360s. It predated the Peasants' Revolt and the narrative of a huge increase in resistance in the late 14th century, causing serfdom to be bargained away from about 1400 to 1450. I discovered that on the vast majority of these manors, serfdom was in headlong retreat by the time the Peasants' Revolt came along in 1381. And that suddenly cast a real problem for me, because I had to suddenly find an, a reason. Okay, why was it disappearing so quickly? And that was quite controversial. I think probably remains quite controversial. But it is very, very hard to argue against the clear evidence that many of the key features of English serfdom were being rapidly eroded away in the 1350s and, and the 1360s. What it does, of course, 
is throw the Black Death. You know, 50% of the population of Western Europe died. It, it throws the Black Death right at the center of the acceleration of the disappearance of serfdom in England. But there's one problem with that. It's exactly the same death rates across the rest of Europe and serfdom remains or is actually reimposed under the same demographic conditions elsewhere. And, oh, now, now that is a challenge. How do we explain that? Not in terms directly of resistance. There must be other explanations as well. But that's where suddenly my discovery in the chronology threw a very different analytical challenge into my court. This is funny. This is why people don't kick the hornet's nest, right? This is why yeah. people don't spend eight years looking at the records, because you yeah. might find something you don't want to find, right? <laughs> exactly. Yeah. I'm, I'm <laughs> deeply foolish, and I continue to be so. <laughs> so you noticed that people were not paying the fines and dues as they normally would as serfs, and you noticed that they weren't being called serfs in the documents. So can you tell us some of the changes and how they happened over time, starting in the 1350s? Yes, I think I think amongst the things that I found was, was firstly tenurial change, and that is that the old labour service package that was characteristic of villain, as we call them, or servile tenancies, was rapidly being diluted. So the Lord just stopped charging things like merchant on landholders, and in some places just start, stopped charging tallage, which is just an arbitrary tax on unfree landholders and, and hereditary serfs. And you could see that these were dropping off. Uh, similarly, new forms of tenure were being introduced. In other words, the old labour service tenure was being converted to money tenures. So a cash rent is just replacing, uh, or indeed to leasehold, what we understand as leasehold. You know, six years, I'll, the Lord will rent the land to any comer, any tenant for a fixed annual sum, and then at the expiry of the term, we'll renegotiate. What we understand as leasehold, quite a lot of English servile land was being converted to leasehold in the 1350s and 1360s. And the reason is that I'm sure that serfs were coming from other people's manors and settling on, on a new manor, taking land on that terms, and then not to serf on the new manor. Or free people were taking the land because they wanted to get a toe on the on the land market and they couldn't get hold of free land. So they were getting unfree land, but on a more acceptable tenure, a tenure that was more acceptable to them than the old one that was associated with labour services and associated with serfdom. So firstly, there, there are tenurial changes taking place. And then secondly, lords were concentrating more on personal civility, which is an hereditary condition through the male line. And they would focus on their movement away from the manor to some extent, and they would focus on merchant. And so if you like, serfdom is becoming more concentrated onto a smaller number of people. And the big difference in England is that you can't create serfs anew because the common law protected free status. So if the Black Death is killing lots of serfs off, and some of them are now running away from the manor and the Lord isn't chasing them, then the percentage of serfs is actually reducing over time as well. So there are a number of factors that are causing it to decline pretty quickly in the 1350s and the 1360s. Now, on some manors, monastic landlords, they do cling on longer and you can see them fighting and you can see the peasantry resisting in the 1380s and 1390s but in the vast majority of places lesser lay landlords don't have the power or the wherewithal nor, nor do i think they have the stomach or the conviction to fight over maintaining serfdom and they're just being very pragmatic after the black death and there's a point at which it is becoming kind of futile to do that, right? One of the things that you mentioned in the book is that if a, a serf who is a woman marries a free man and they have a child, that child is free as well, isn't it? Yeah, exactly. And I think one of the more interesting aspects of the research that I focused on since I wrote the book is there's more interest and record after the Black Death 
of the departure of female serfs. And actually, the Lord isn't doing much about it other than effectively creating a sort of tagging system. Where has Alice Parman gone to? She's she's left the manor. Where's she gone to? And each year where she is travelling to is tracked. But they don't drag her back to the manor. They don't send a posse to retrieve her. They don't even charge them any money. The manor just tracks where she goes. So this is an interesting example. If you're a Marxist historian, you would say that this is demeaning and oppressive. Um, if you were being pragmatic, you would say, yes, it is but it's having no effect at all. She's she's left the manor, she's doing what she wants. Is it stigmatic and irritating that the Lord is keeping track of where she's moving from year to year until she gets married, then she disappears from the record? Is that stigmatic and demeaning and frust- irritating? Yes. But is it actually practically stopping her from moving around and actually acting as an independent economic agent, she's finding work in living servanthood. She's working for brewers for a year, then she's working for textile manufacturers, and she's moving on annual contracts. You can see her. We can guess she's in her late teens, uh, early 20s. And so the remnants, that the sort of shadow of serfdom means that lords track her but the reality is that she is effectively a free agent and one of the interesting arguments is the extent to which after the black death employment opportunities allow servile women to move around and to become effectively drawn into the labor market as a result of which they are delaying age at first marriage, they are deciding to be independent economic agents, that they're not being put into forced marriages, they're probably choosing their partners in their mid-20s for affectionate reasons rather than for harsh family pressure or economic reasons, they're making their own choices, and that the Black Death is part and parcel of liberating women's marital choices and increasing their choices as independent economic agents. And we can address that type of debate from the types of record we have of migrant serfs. I think that that is important, both recognising that serfs are moving around, finding work, perhaps not being chased, but being kept track of. And one of the things I thought was interesting that you mentioned in the book as well, is that when a lord is keeping track of a serf who may have moved to a town, sometimes that serf is choosing to pay a fee to be associated with that manor continually, kind of as insurance. So can you tell us how that might have worked? Yes, it is curious. I was looking at a case recently of a woman called Mabel who was orphaned in the Black Death of 1349 and she was looked after by a guardian. And then when she was 14, she inherited the cottage that her father and mother had left when they died in the Black Death six years earlier. And then two years later, Mabel's in London and she's living and working in London and the court records it. They don't chase after her. They don't fine her. In 1362, she comes back to the manor, lives there for about six months and sells her cottage to somebody locally. She would have got a capital sum for that. Even though it's a servile cottage, she would have got the capital sum for that. And she goes back to London and she's still living there in the 1370s. And what it shows, I think, particularly for England, and this goes to the heart of why does serfdom disappear in England and not in other parts of Europe? I think what it shows is that there's a difference between the theory and the practice. The the, the Lord is, if you like, barking by tracking Mabel, but the Lord is not biting by stopping Mabel from moving around or getting her to pay. But also there are plenty of employment opportunities, either in the countryside or in towns in England. And the availability of those outside options makes it very, very difficult for lords actually to enforce serfdom. What do they do? Go off to London, grab Mabel, put her in a cart, bring her back, fine her. She stays overnight. She's off next morning. (laughs) She goes back to London. What are they going to do? Chain her? You know, put a slab of of stone around her ankle so she can't leave. If you're living in a different part of Europe where there are very few outside options, 
it's easier to maintain serfdom. It's more cost effective to maintain serfdom. The availability of land on attractive tenures, of work opportunities, and as you mentioned, Mabel's been contracted. Alice Parman is being contracted. She's working on one-year contracts for a fixed sum board and lodging and some cash as well. These are modern, well, recognisably modern labour contracts which are enforceable in law already, just as something like a leasehold is enforceable in law. It's a contract enforceable in law. And another reason, I think, for the disappearance of serfdom in England is that you've already got the development of of a relatively large land market and a very relatively large labour market where the relations are contractual for cash. So you're already moving into factor markets based on a cash nexus, supported by a rudimentary framework of laws around that, which, of course, is very different from the compulsion system of serfdom. And you've already got a system which has actually been accelerated by the labour shortages kicked off by the Black Death. I think you have to pick your battles, right? If you can get cash, get the cash, right? Instead of trying to chase down a serf who has left the manor. Absolutely, yeah. People have been pragmatic. You know, serfs know what they can get away with and lords know that they can posture, but beyond a certain point, they don't have much effective enforcement powers. They may make a point every now and then. You do get occasional cases. There's one family that were essentially an abbot in Yorkshire, sent his officials to get three members of family who'd run away from the manor, locked them in the abbey, but locked them in the latrine. And the three serfs escaped down the latrine pathway. Not a clean getaway, clearly, (laughs) but they escaped. And the Lord didn't bother to chase them again. But for some reason, the Lord had decided to make a real statement about capturing them and and incarcerating them in the first place. So occasionally, lords will make a statement, a significant statement, like physically seizing a serf and bringing them back. But it was very rare. I think that that... pragmatic. Yeah. And that's something that you mentioned in the book as well, is that you might have more enforcement by monastic houses. And that might be an ideological thing, because you were saying in the book that perhaps they are trying to make sure that they are following their mandates, right? The mandate that they have as tenants, and it's tied to ideas like who is in charge of things and what they owe to the saint, perhaps, that is the founder of their abbey, things like that. And that perhaps, perhaps one of the things that might have led to the peasants' revolt was some serfs, perhaps on an abbot's land, looking at their neighbors and saying, wait a second, (laughs) they are having a better deal than we are. And perhaps that might have been one of the sparks. Am I characterizing that right? Yes, certainly. The fact that serfdom on some manners has rapidly disappeared in the 1350s and 1360s and yet continues on some other manners without question into the 15th century, usually on the estates of the great Benedictine monastic, highly conservative bureaucratic landlords, must have created a sense of relative deprivation among serfs. How come they've been released de facto and we still are being called serfs and the Lord is still trying to enforce some labour services on us and is still trying to track our movement, still trying to charge merchant on our daughters and so on. And it is the case that tenants of monastic landlords did feature pretty prominently in some aspects of the Peasants' Revolt in 1381. There's no doubt that it is an element. And I think one of the really important points that some historians make is that for all the points I've been making about laws being pragmatic and there's a difference between what they do in the ground on the ground and in practice and, and what the theory is, but there's always that nagging fear. There's there's uncertainty about free people don't have that nagging fear and that uncertainty. The unfree, the serfs do. You know, even if your lord has not charged you or called you a serf for twenty years, what happens if a new lord comes in, takes over the manor, and then says, "Okay, we're winding back the clock." It's here we go again. Labour services. I'm going to start. Yeah, 
there is that nagging fear. There is that element of uncertainty. And there's also a sense, I think, that even if you are of a, from a family of serfs, there's a social sniffiness particularly if you've risen through the social ranks, you're you're reasonably wealthy or a very wealthy peasant villager. Occasionally in the 15th century, one captures from chronicles or letters a, a certain, oh, you realise that peasant X is doing very well these days. But of course, he's from a family of serfs, don't you know? <laughs> some form like that. And it's not for serfs to set the world from. They ought to know their place. Mm -hmm. One of the best examples of that is the prioress of Redlingfield must have fallen in love with a serf who had done fantastically well. And the rumour was there was a scandal that there was a, a relationship between them. And that's documented in, in one source. In the court role of her manor, the name of that peasant is recorded and in the original court role, it had said, next to his name, Nativus Domini de Sanguine, Neef of the Lord by Blood. And somebody had scratched it out. <laughs> it had been scratched out. And the guess is that, you know, this is very demeaning. The scribe had put it in to remind everybody that the peasant who was rumoured to be having a scandalous affair with the prioress of Redlingfield was a serf. And somebody, probably the prioress herself, or somebody <laughs> sensitive to her within her administration, had got the rubber out and rubbed it out. So, but, but it shows that there's still a stigma and there's still an uncertainty, which must have been unsettling, disconcerting, deeply irritating. Mm hmm. Mm -hmm, absolutely. And I can imagine you'd want to shed that as quickly as possible. And that one of the best ways to do that was to be anonymous in a town, right? <laughs> move away and don't tell anyone that you were a serf before. The other way was to buy your freedom. And, and here we do resonate with Roman notions of slavery or classical notions of slavery. You could buy your freedom. You could acquire a charter of manumission. If serfdom in England, for example, was so repugnant to them, it was certainly irritating, but if it was an economic disadvantage and a very, very significant social disadvantage, you would expect many serfs to seek formal manumission. They would pay, probably through the nose, um, but they would pay a significant sum in order to get their legal freedom. They would be given a charter showing they had become free. In fact, there aren't that many records of manumission. Now, that may be that they just don't survive, but we suspect that not that many serfs thought it was worth paying a large sum in order to formally acquire freedom. Those that did often went back to their own manorial court with the charter and paid to have it recorded in the manorial court that they were now free, they weren't nativi, and usually these charters say, and their progeny and their progeny and all of their goods and chattels for time immemorial are free. You know, so clearly a lawyer had also taken a fee to, to <laughs> put all, all of that type of detail and small print in. But you sense the pride of those who did get manumission of saying, I am now formally free. And sometimes, in fairness, lords would generously give a charter of manumission to somebody who'd been a loyal servant to them in their household, maybe a serf from their estate who'd ended up working in the seigneurial household. And at the end of a long lifetime of service, they might be given a charter of manumission and for their children and so on. It wouldn't matter so much to the individual, but for their children, it, it was often a gesture. So it was certainly a condition was much lighter than classical notions of what serfdom entailed um, was in reality, but for some, still well worth evading, well yes. worth evading. Yes. So I could talk about this forever. I'm just loving this, but we probably should wrap it up. So can you tell us when do we see serfdom disappearing? At what point does it disappear from England completely? There are still serfs recorded in the late 16th century, but they are very few and far between. And 
it's never formally abolished. Serfdom is never formally abolished. And that is a, an idiosyncrasy of, of the common law, because the common law determined that serfdom was nothing to do with the common law. Therefore, how could the royal courts and common lawyers formally abolish serfdom? Well, they, they can't. So it withers. And so you can say it's still there in England, the late 16th century. But I would say that in England, the percentage of the population who are serfs was probably about 40% in the 1340s. It's probably as low as 10% by 1400. And it's it's maybe one or 2% by 1500. So you decide then, it's a subjective judgment as to when it's effectively disappeared. But I would say that it, it is an irrelevance by the middle of the 15th century and is a minority condition already by 1400. Well, this is an absolutely massive change. And I'm so glad I came across your research about this because I think it does push back against so many narratives about this. And it's important for people to get their hands dirty, as you say, <laughs> look into the records and see what can be found there. Thank you so much, Mark, for telling us all about serfdom. This has been very enlightening for me and I think for everyone else. It's been a pleasure. Anybody who can endure serfdom for almost an hour has my unbridled respect and admiration. <laughs> to find out more about Mark's work, you can visit his faculty page at the University of East Anglia at research-portal.uea.ac.uk slash en slash persons slash Mark hyphen Bailey. His book is The Decline of Serfdom in Late Medieval England, From Bondage to Freedom. Before we go, here's Peter from Medievalist.net to tell us what's on the website. What's going on, Peter? Hey, hey. Well, first, some sad news to report on because of the earthquake that struck Turkey and Syria earlier this week. It's a huge human tragedy, and I don't want to make light of that or anything like that. But we did want to make a report on how the quake affected historic sites, including medieval sites. And there's now efforts by UNESCO and other bodies to see what can be done to repair these places. So we have news on that. Plus, there's been a lot of archaeological discoveries that came out in the last week or so, including this giant sword that was discovered in Japan. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, it's like eight feet long. So we have that. Plus, I also have a piece that looks at warfare in 13th century Iceland. It's one of the very few times that there's any military events that take place there. And I found it really fascinating. So I have a little piece on that. Excellent. Well, I'm glad that you mentioned that our hearts are going out to the people who are affected by this earthquake, and it is going to make a major difference to our field. But more than that, we really have compassion for the people who are suffering over there. So thank you for mentioning that. And I'm hoping that you will continue to cover that for us on Medievalist.net. Sometimes it's odd trying to cover tragedies, and these are massive human tragedies, but I guess we should, as a historians, take a look at the effect it is on historical sites and UNESCO and others, that's their major in interest in it. Mm -hmm. Well, thank you for keeping us updated on that. And of course, there's all of the other stuff to check out, including a massive Japanese sword. Thanks, yeah. Peter. All right. Get well soon, Danielle. Thanks. Thank you, as always, to all of you patrons on Medievalist.net's Patreon page, whose generosity helps to support my podcast and the work of other indie writers and podcasters who contribute to their website. Patrons can access all sorts of goodies like subscriptions to the Medieval Magazine and Medieval World Magazine, as well as ad-free versions of this podcast. To become a patron, please visit patreon.com slash medievalists. For surfs and turf, follow Medievalist.net on Facebook or Twitter at Medievalist. You can find me, Danielle Sabolski, on social media at 5MIN Medievalist or 5 Minute Medievalist. And you can find my books at all your favorite bookstores, where you can get hold of How to Live Like a Monk, Medieval Wisdom for Modern Life, in hardcover, ebook, and audiobook. Our music is Beyond the Warriors by Geefrog. Thanks for listening, and have yourself an amazing day. Music